One of the most successful producers in the history of popular music. Born in Stoke Heath, Coventry, Pete Waterman left Whiteley Abbey Comprehensive School in the early 60s to work for British Railways, demonstrating an interest in rail that would become a lifelong passion. However, his other great passion for music became his living as a touring DJ, building up a record collection that included many rare US imports and comprised a blend of rhythm and blues and soul music with which to entertain and inspire crowds. Pete Waterman then entered the music industry proper as an A&R man scouting for talent and overseeing the artistic development of recording artists and songwriters. But it was his establishment of his own company, PWL, in 1984, in which he signed producers Matt Aitken and Mike Stock that he hit the stratosphere. Stock, Aitken, Waterman became one of the most successful musical production teams of the 80s, if not the 20th century altogether. To date, Pete Waterman has scored a total of 22, that's right, 22 UK number one singles with various acts, including Dead or Alive, remember them? Kylie Minogue, Rick Astley, Bananarama, Steps, Mel and Kim, Donna Summer, Sinita, Cliff Richard and Jason Donovan. And he has achieved upwards of 500 million sales worldwide. Pete Waterman was also at the forefront of talent TV shows appearing as a judge on both series of Pop Idol and Pop Stars The Rivals, which were both precursors to The X Factor and Britain's Got Talent. As mentioned, Pete's passion goes beyond music with a lifelong love of model railways in which he has been a world-renowned collector. And he's a big fan of the real thing too, having been involved in several railway ventures, including the revival of London and North West Railway as a brand. And he achieved what must have been a personal dream, establishing Waterman Railways in his own name. And he's the founder of the Waterman Railway Heritage Trust. So I've got just one question. How does he find the time? Pete Waterman, welcome to GB News. Thank you, Mark. Well, Great to have you on the programme. Pete, have you Thank always you. loved music? Yes, ever since a kid. What um, kind of music were you exposed to as a kid? Originally, uh, church music, because um, I'm from a very religious family. And um, then along came rock and roll, and, you know, it, it totally fascinated me. So uh, originally it was, it was choral music, it was hymns, that kind of thing. You engaged with the melody, but nothing beats Elvis Presley and Bill Bailey. Well, I, I think I invented air guitar. I was the best air guitarist in my class at school. I was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I used to love getting up in front of all the kids and singing. You know, it, it was uh, just something I, I just I just love doing. Of course, you are a legendary uh, music impresario, uh, a remarkable record producer with an ear for a tune. Um, have you played an instrument yourself? I play the guitar. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't say I'm great, but I'm, I can bash out a tune. And some say I've bashed it out all my life, you know, so... <laughs> Nothing new here. I left, the, I left the clever stuff to Matt and Mike. They're, you know, they're great musicians. Uh, it's a remarkable story, isn't it? And, and what motivated you to start your own production company in 1984? Because you were already doing well in the music industry. Why did you go it alone? Because I wanted to do, I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And when I was working for other people, um, I found that all I was doing was doing what they wanted to do. And that, that the hits were great, but it, it it just wasn't satisfying for me. I wanted to be Motown. That's what I wanted, you know. I love Motown. I love what Barry Gordy and Holland Ocean Holland were doing, and I just thought that's what I wanted to do. And you know, nobody gave me that opportunity at a major record company, so I thought, well, have a go yourself. What was the unique business model of Motown? For those that don't know, of course we. We're aware that it produced some of the greatest soul artists of all time, including Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye. Uh, but but uh, it was a unique, I mean, it was a building, wasn't it? And, and, and in that building, people could just be very creative and they were not constrained by commercial pressures. No, but more than that, it was, it was the first real street then. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get through to, to an audience, you know, to the people that were buying our records uh, and not 
have accountants uh, as part of the, the, the complication. And, um, you know, we came up with a, a sort of whole thing. I mean, we even chose the name Stockgate and Waterman based on as, as close as we could get to Holland, Ozzy and Holland. That's what we wanted to do. For sure. And of course, you established the company in 1984. The rest is history. What did you do differently? Differently. Well, I think you just said it. We, 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 we were in a building where creativity was all there was. Mm. We knew the market and it was, it, we didn't go outside. We, we just, um, all the musicians were in there all the time. The engineers were in there all the time. They, I made sure they had no worries. You know, all they could concentrate was on the music. So if they had a, a personal problem, we tried to sort it out for them. Like we got the mortgages and we, we set them up with banks and made sure their tax was paid um, so that they could concentrate just on music. They didn't have to worry about anything else. Um, and we also did something which uh, I'd never done before, but I knew we should do. We had a strict working timetable. In other words, we worked from, say, uh, 11 o'clock. We took a break at 5 o'clock and we finished at nine. We didn't go all night. Mm -hmm. So we had a night shift and a day shift, and nobody worked more than sort of eight hours. Um, because I always believed that if, if once you go past that eight hours, creativity starts to go like that. I mean, it takes a dip. Um, we also were alcohol-free completely. Didn't allow any alcohol in the building. And we definitely didn't allow any drugs. Again, it was like you had to concentrate on making music. Clearly a family atmosphere and a very professional environment too, which might have been at odds with the music scene at that time. What's more important in the creation of a hit, Pete, the melody or the lyric? Well, first the melody, because it's what people, people walk away with that tune in their head, you know. And, and it really is the first eight bars. And the, the first lyric, funny enough, you say, I say that, but I contradict myself slightly, because the first lyric you hear is very, very important. Because that's what gets you. you. You know, you hear, of, you know, the first line and you go, what comes next? So you've got to build up. And then obviously the chorus is the payoff. So, you know, people think that, you know, writing songs is easy. It is actually the artist's job that you can do because you you walk a tightrope between banality and genius. Mm. And what about talent as songwriters and producers? Because this was a factory of hits. It was the world's musical talent that were your, at your disposal. So how did you go about choosing the right voice for the right song? Well, we, uh, what in hindsight we did, which was very different from anybody else, and certainly is very different the way that music works today. We didn't want to work with people who were already having hits unless we really liked them. We wanted to work with new talent uh, and give, you know, and we found it easy to work with them. Um, it allowed us to be creative. Um, Donna Summer obviously was an exception. Cliff Richard was an exception. But then, as you know, you'll say, and we, obviously we, did, we worked with Paul McCartney. Um, that's for you. That's for you. You know, you want to work with Paul McCartney. You want to work with Donna Summer because they are legends. They are absolutely brilliant. And you want to see if actually you can come up to scratch with them. That's that's the thing. And what about um, the, the likes of Kylie Minogue? Was it a gamble working with her, given that she was mainly known as a soap opera at that point, a soap opera actress? Oh, Mark, it was, it, 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 it's easy enough, you know, now looking back, uh, we didn't have time to even think about it. We just met this girl. Um, we literally, I, well, I had forgotten that she was even coming to the studio. We hadn't written the song. And literally she sat in the reception while we wrote, I should be so lucky. I, I was even in Manchester on the phone. Um but again, this was, you know, we were nice guys. We weren't going to send her back to Australia without a song. So we cobbled together, I should be so lucky. We didn't finish it. I mean, we just got it together so she could catch a flight because I think she only had three hours in the studio. And, um, you know, 
we really didn't know what we got. And, and you know, I remember we offered highly uh, to every record company. We didn't want to be a record company. I mean, the great thing is they all turned us down. And I was offering Kylie for 500 quid. Now, let's put this in context, Mark. We That week I offered Kylie to, to the record industry, we had five records in the top 10, and I was asking for 500 pounds for the record. You would have thought that anybody would have said, I'll take 500 quid. Thanks very much, son. Here it is. No, they all went, nah. You'll never break a TV star. And that was the greatest break we ever had, you know. Um, we knew that uh, she was – we knew that she was great because, I mean, she she picked up the song and she'd done it in probably an hour absolute maximum and, and was out the door. And um, to be honest, we, we didn't know what we got and um, took a long time to finish the record. And I got a – there were telexes in those days. We didn't have texts or emails. And I got a telex from Australia – so when are they going to hear the Kylie Minogue record? Because obviously she was signed to an Australian record company. I had to go and ask Mike what the song was called because I'd forgotten. And I sent them a telex that said, you will hear it soon and you should be so lucky because it's a hit. Uh, and I remember we, we made it and I had a call from the BBC, from the head of BBC, um, Light Entertainment, uh, Michael Hurl. And he said, I hear you've produced uh, Kylie Minogue. Can you send the record over to me or a tape? And we put the tape on a bike. And he rang back and he said, I'm going to put her on the Noel Edmonds Late Late Christmas show. Now, this was like the most powerful man in television and the music industry ringing me and saying he was going to play my record Christmas morning on the biggest show on television. You know, I pinched myself and thought, I can't believe this is happening. You know, and when we put the record out, it was in January, and uh, we were in the south of France at the music festival at Medem. And we were literally, we had to phone Radio 1 on Sunday afternoon to find out even if we were in the chart, we were that uncertain that we'd even be in the chart. You know, and I remember it, it came in at like, I don't know, six or seven or eight, or what, I can't remember. But I remember I had a cup of tea and a piece of cake. It was fantastic. That's right. I think I remember but, the video was... Was it Kylie on the back of a back of an open top car or, or a jeep? Yeah, and she was she was in the bubble bath. If you remember, right, with yeah. all the like writing on the back, remember? I remember that too. Of course, I do. How important is the video to make a hit, Pete? Well, she was on a television show every day that was getting you know ten, eleven million viewers, and um, suddenly uh, because she was a tomboy, you know, because. She, she was the mechanic in the series, and uh, we we didn't know, but I mean the kids had already, you know, were all over her, and uh, you know as soon as they played the record, boof, off it went. Um, and of course the video plays straight into the neighbours thing. I mean in hindsight, all these years later, you look at the video and you go, you would have never made that video if you'd have actually thought about it. But because it was made in Australia, and they weren't used to making re- uh, videos like we were making videos in Britain at the time, like Duran Duran, that were gorgeous videos. This was such a simple little video. Mm. And it worked because it was so simple. You know, this is a girl off Neighbours in a bubble bath. Every little boy's dream. Did you have any inkling that Kylie Minogue would go on to become such a global superstar? She owes her career to you, Pete, but did you see it coming? I rem- the, the one thing I remember, Mark, was when we recorded Hand on Your Heart, Matt Aitken, who never, ever, ever passed an opinion, came out of the studio and went, this girl is a superstar and she's going to be around a long time. And I always remember that because it was like, whoa, I've never heard Matt ever pass an opinion on anything. It is an amazing, amazing story. Uh, you've written some of the most best-selling and also best pop songs of the 20th century. Uh, you and your team dominated the charts in the 80s. Do you think there's a degree of snobbery about some of your output? Oh, you know, of course. Of course there is. Yes, absolutely. But, you know, if you don't read your criticism, you don't worry about it. I never read a review. I mean, I only ever read one review, and that was for the first record we ever made, uh, which was for, for Divine. And after that, I never read another review. Because, I'm, you know, I wasn't looking for, uh, for pats on the back from, from the critics. I was looking for people to buy the records 
And that, that was what we focused on. You know, yeah, I mean, nev you know, never going to give you up. One of the, the, the best pop songs of all time. You know, I've just been through, you know, there, there's a website here with 40 of some of your best songs. And that's just a tip of of the iceberg. Where did that snobbery come from? Because people thought that we were churning them out because you, you've already said we were, you know, we worked like a factory. We made it like a job. We, we perfected, you know, we came into work. Uh, with a with a mission. If it didn't work, we stopped. We didn't try and carry on. And it looked, I guess, to people who thought that music should be, you know, intellectualised, it, it, it looked like frippery. Well, you know, I remember the Daily Telegraph did an amazing story on us. It was, we were on the front of, of the Daily Telegraph. And they really gave us a pounding. I mean, just pounded us. And we had a lovely call. Uh, from, a, from a lady at the Times who said, I'm going to defend you. And she said, because my daughter loves your stuff. And she said, yes, it's bubblegum, it's all candy floss, but candy floss is a magical substance as long as you clean your teeth. Well, and I thought that was right. brilliant. Too right. I, I remember when Elton John, Elton John got pelters when he released Crocodile Rock. But it went to number one in America and he was laughing all the way to the bank. Who cares? It's just jealousy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is. And um, we didn't care. I mean, you must remember, I mean, we were so successful. They took the category out of the Brits so that we couldn't win it. And, and, and that in itself was, was, was an honour to us. Because, again, that made us even hard, work harder, you know. Cool. We took a fabulous advert in the Music Week, which is a trade press, which is which came up to the Brits and, and it said, you can love us, you can hate us, you ain't ever going to change us, we ain't ever going to be respectable. And that's where Mel and Kim got their first hit from. Amazing, amazing. Another, another classic Stock Aiken Waterman hit. What are your thoughts about the future of the music industry, given that bands are struggling to get by on the income they receive from streaming, Pete? Well... I think streaming needs looking at because I think in, in my entire career in the music industry, um, there was always this um, underlying thing about hype and, and fix it. Um, and, you know, our charts were incredibly scrupulously managed um, by the industry and fair. Now, of course, streaming is, it, well, it's, it, they put up what they want on the front page um, to drive the to drive the machine because that's how they make the money. So it's not fair. It's not level playing field, and it's doing the industry a lot of harm. Will there ever be a stock aching waterman again? I'm not sure. More's the pity because you produced hundreds of hours of fantastic music that I still sing along to in the shower. I'll spare you the gory details. Um, Pete Waterman, a privilege to have you on the show. I do hope you'll join us in the studio next time you're in London. I will, Mark. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, brilliant, brilliant conversation. A true legend of the music industry, Pete Waterman there.